views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Okay. Thank you all for coming out. Um, my name is Hatu Kamara. I'm a community liaison at Congressman Serrano's office. And I want to welcome all of you to this morning's annual Black History Month celebration. So thank you for coming. <laughs> so to get started, unfortunately, our um, uh, national anthem performer couldn't make it. Um, he's under the flu. So what we're going to do is if, um, I can ask if all of you to please rise and we'll sing together. Ladies and gentlemen, please stay standing for the um, Black National Anthem. Oh 
please remain standing while I welcome Imam Musa Kaba of Masjid al-Rahmah for um, one of this morning's invocation. Good morning. Good morning. Here we come. We all are standing before our Lord, the Creator, the Lord of the creation. In His name, which is in the Arabic language, Bismillah rahman rahim In the name of Allah, the Beneficent and the Merciful, we praise You, Lord. We are standing before You. We need Your support. We need Your help. Here we meet with our leaders. Please lead them and guide us and save us and protect us. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawmiddin Iyaka Na'abudu wa Iyaka Nasta'in Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqim Sirat Al-Lazina An-Amta Alayhim Ghayri Al-Maghdubi Alayhim Waladhalin Ameen Say Ameen Thank you Thank you, Imam Kaba. And now um, the invocation from the Reverend Alfonso Wyatt, founder of Strategic Destiny. Amen. The presence has already been invoked by Imam. I say, God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, we gather here as brothers and sisters with no agenda other than to celebrate, to liberate, and to help some uh, continue the struggle. We thank you for the leader, our congressman, who has saved, served faithfully all these many years. We thank you for the honorees that are giving of themselves in order to make life better for someone else. What other thing can we celebrate when we come together when we come as your children, as your called out ones, bless each person under the sound of my voice that thought it not robbery to come forward. Thank you for those in the police department that, that keep us safe. Thank you for those in the civic groups, in schools, and in all of the nonprofits that go forth. We ask that you continue to bless us on this Black History Month. Bless the celebration. I'm going to bless the food so when we can eat, we will eat. Amen. We thank you. Amen? Amen. 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 I, I, I would be remiss. You can sit down now. <laughs> for those of you that heard uh, the Negro National Anthem for the first time, we just usually sing the first refrain. All right? It, <laughs> Yes, uh, it, it, in keeping with the black history tradition, it was a poem that was turned into a song. So we thank you, we thank you. And I thank my honorees, my brother over here, uh, uh, First Depth over here, Ben Tucker. We've known each other for a number of years. And Sister Majors and the one, I've seen you on TV, my brother, uh, yesterday. I'm going to get your autograph. I won't get their autograph, but I'll get those. And thank Anthony Jordan over there. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Wyatt. And now I'd like to welcome our host for this morning, President Dr. David Gomez, President of Hostos Community College. I've asked uh, the Reverend to please never have me follow him again. <laughs> um, but good morning to all of you and welcome to Hostos Community College. This month, <clears throat> we are celebrating the vital contributions made to this country by our African-American brothers and sisters, past and present. We are the richer for what these men and women have achieved, often under the most harrowing of circumstances. Lonnie G. Bunch III, who is the director of the Smithsonian National Museum of African-American History and Culture, has written, who could not help but be inspired by Martin Luther King's oratory commitment to racial justice, and his ultimate sacrifice. Who could not draw substance from the creativity of Madam C.J. Walker 
or the audacity and courage of prize fighter Jack Johnson. I find comfort in the rhythms of Louis Armstrong, Sam Cooke, or Dinah Washington. And I draw inspiration from the anonymous slave who persevered so that the culture could continue. African Americans have distinguished themselves in every conceivable occupation and field of study. What they have given to this world is a testament to the human spirit, a source of strength and joy, a chronicle of suffering and triumph. Ostos is a fitting locale for today's event since such a significant portion of our student population is African American and the college has long been an advocate for social justice and equality. I am pleased to be joined by such good friends of this institution as the Honorable Congressman Jose E. Serrano and State Senator Jose M. Serrano in celebrating Black History Month. It is more important than ever in these troubling times that all of the voices of this country be heard, acknowledged, and appreciated. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you, President Gomez, and welcome once again to our annual Black History Month celebration. I want to thank my son, Senator Serrano, for picking me up this morning and driving me over here, uh, although we both live around the corner. But it's nice to see all of you, and uh, thank you, President Gomez, for the work you do in our community. Austos is an institution that serves us all well, and you have been able uh, under your leadership to continue to grow Osos Community College. Osos is very much a part of the history of this community. There were times when Osos was not seen as something that should live. And like so many people and so many ideas in our community and in the black community, it was seen as something that should not continue. But the people said we will continue. And the leaders said we will continue. And everybody became leaders in the community and here it is today, growing every single day. It started as a tire factory when we took over that building, not took over the building, but uh, rented the building or purchased the building. And now it's this institution that is so much a part of our community. So we're glad to be here. For me and for my son, the senator, this, uh, that sounds good, my son, the senator, right? I mean, <laughs> my son, the doctor, you know, <laughs> my son, the senator. Uh, for me, it's uh, quite an honor always to be part of this celebration that we bring together because those of us who try to forget or who don't know how to keep in mind the history of our communities then get lost somewhere along the way. The fact of life is that the struggle of the Puerto Rican community, in my case, the struggle of the Latino community and other communities, has been documented and continues to be a struggle today. But we cannot deny the fact that it was the African-American community that started a movement called the Civil Rights Movement, which opened up so many doors, not just for African-Americans, but for everyone else. The fact of life is that I represent a district that a long time ago elected Herman Badillo as the first congressman and then Robert Garcia. And that district was, the Republicans are going to hate this, designed to give an opportunity to someone from our community to be elected to Congress. And Herman was the first one from our community to be elected. I hold that seat now. And so I can't deny the fact that so many people who are here today, because some won't admit their age, but they were in the struggle a long time ago, made it possible for me to stand before you as a member of Congress. And now chairman of a new committee, not chairman, but new chairman of a committee that will oversee the funding of the FBI, of the Census Bureau, of the Justice Department, of NASA, NOAA. So if any of you want to go up into space, just talk to me and uh, <laughs> I can arrange it quicker than you think. And, uh, and tomorrow's our first hearing. If you see me slip out, and I won't try to do that, it's because we're heading to Washington. And let me tell you a little bit about traveling to Washington. I usually take the train, but 
on a day when the wind is blowing or the rain is coming down or the snow is coming down, the planes stop flying. So everybody rushes to the train to get to Washington and we fight for seats. And then tomorrow we will have the first hearing of our committee on appropriations uh, that I will chair. And at that moment, as I do on many occasions, I will think of the struggle of our community, of the struggle of our joint community, and of the struggle of my father and mother, may they rest in peace, who uh, just did Puerto Rican history by doing what they did every day. Which brings me to my last point. We honor some people here today who've made a name. But, you know, there are people in the black community who never wrote a book, who never got on TV, who've never been interviewed, who've never been uh, elected to a public office, but who every day by the simple fact that they get up and they go to work or they look out for their neighbor or they find out if Ms. Smith is okay during a winter storm or go to church on a Sunday or temple during the week, then they are every day making American history, which is in this case, Black History Month. Because black history is no different than American history. It is a segment of American history. When we elected Barack Obama, it was celebrated in the black community. I did. I thought I would never see it happen, and I saw it happen. Of course, I never thought I'd see what I'm seeing now happen, and, uh, and I'm seeing it happen. But it was really part of American history. And when I made a poster at that time with a picture of Sonia Sotomayor and Barack Obama, people said to me, and I called it history, right? People said, why didn't you say America, uh, black history? Why didn't you say Puerto Rican history? I said, because if we hadn't elected him, he wouldn't have pointed her to the Supreme Court. And so you see, it's really American history to prove that one could be president and one could be a member of the Supreme Court. And that's... <laughs> and so congratulations to all the honorees. We will uh, conduct this uh, today with the love and the admiration that we have with, for all of you. And with that in mind, I thank you for the support you always give me. And I thank you for something I don't discuss with you in public, but I know you do in private for your prayers and your thoughts that you send to me and to my son and all who are in elected office today. So with that, I leave you with a person I've known for a long, long time, <laughs> who's a great senator and who is just one of the nicest people I know who happened to get elected, Senator Jose M. Serrano. Thank you very much um, for those remarks and for your kind words. And you know, I love um, the photo that they have of you here on this wall. Um, if uh, if you haven't had a chance to take a look at that photo, that is uh, is a great. Uh, it's a great sort of uh, accurate description of the struggle for for Ostos Community College, and uh, by the looks of that tie that he's wearing, I was probably uh, six years old when that picture was taken. But it's uh, it's really great to be here with all of you, and I want to thank uh, all of our honorees and all of our guests for uh, being with us today to help us celebrate and acknowledge and respect. Uh, something that is so critically important uh, in our community that is uh, uh, African, Amer uh, African American history and culture. Uh, and today is a wonderful celebration of that. And I want to thank Ostos Community College uh, for once again hosting us and also, you know, with a firm understanding that this college is not only a fine academic institution, but for many, many years, uh, since its inception, has been a beacon, a hub for civic engagement in our community, and um, has benefited us in so many different ways and giving us a space uh, for us to come together and to become more engaged uh, members of our, of our government. Um, I would like to thank uh, my staff and the congressman's staff for all of their hard work in putting this together, all of the staff and volunteers uh, President David Gomez for his 
uh, many years of uh, unwavering dedication to academics in this community, uh, to the Imam and the Reverend for their wonderful remarks, uh, and all of our guests who are here, uh, too many to mention, who uh, every day work to ensure that we have a community that is, uh, that is vibrant, livable, and, and continues to grow. Uh, I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank uh, so many of the NYPD who are with, uh, with us here today. Uh, I'll start off with um, uh, Patrol Chief, uh, Assistant Chief for the Bronx, uh, Chief Larry Nakunin uh, from the 40th, 40th Precinct, Captain Robert uh, Galatelli uh, from the 43rd Precinct, Deputy Inspector Benjamin Gurley from the from the 44th Precinct, Deputy Inspector uh, Louis DeSigley from the 45th Precinct, Captain Thomas Frazier. From the 46th, Inspector Wilson Arambales. Uh, from the 48th, Deputy Inspector Andre Brown. From the 49th, Captain Andrew Natif. I'm sorry if I'm saying that incorrectly. Um, from the 52nd, Deputy Inspector Thomas Alps. From PSA 8, Captain uh, Keon Ramsey. And uh, Deputy Inspector Joyce Williams. And Deputy Inspector Zahir Aziz is also with us, and I would like to thank all of the NYPD uh, for being with us. Uh, we see them at every event, and in this community, I can say with uh, a great deal of confidence that uh, I can't think of a better time uh, for police community relations than we've seen in the last few years. Uh, and I give the local NYPD so much credit for being so engaged uh, and doing so many uh, different things to help engage the community in different ways. You know, our theme today is about justice and all the different ways and vehicles in which we achieve justice. And we have to do that. Uh, we have to do that hand in hand with our NYPD and with our judges and with all of the stakeholders who ensure that we can achieve that. So I, I would like to thank NYPD for being here and for your leadership. So one of the first things that I remember hearing as a, as a child uh, through listening through the activism of my dad was no justice, no peace. Uh, and this was a common refrain, but you have to really think, what does this really mean? Uh, I, and I didn't take it as sort of an adversarial statement. I took it as a statement that if you have justice, if you can create justice, find justice, work for justice, the other things will happen. The other good things will happen. And if there is no justice, and if you're not striving for justice, none of the good things in society that we hope and care about will be achievable. So in today's program, the, the common theme is justice. It is finding ways to achieve that through safe streets, uh, through uh, a judicial system uh, that is fair. Uh, by people working in their community to achieve justice in different ways. Uh, and this is something that I think is so fundamentally important, that we as a society know that we cannot expect to live and raise our families and do better in life unless we achieve justice. And indeed, the entire civil rights movement was based on the notion of achieving justice. How do we get there? How do we overcome the injustices that were all around? Uh, that were part, unfortunately, of this nation's history that we work and strive to overcome. So in today's, uh, in today's uh, honorees, you will hear that refrain. That will be something that we are touching upon and helping to ensure that we achieve justice in our community. Uh, we have a number of uh, guests who are here with us today. Um, you will be hearing from our uh, Deputy Borough President, Marika Scott McFadden, in one moment. We are also joined by Mariel De La Cruz, uh, the Bronx Borough Director from Controller Scott Stringer's office. Uh, Arlene Parks is with us, Joyce Hoagie, Tracy McDermott from the Borough President's office. Um, we have Ted Jefferson from Bulb. Uh, we have the Director of Community Affairs from the Bronx DA, Mealing Vieira Delgado. Uh, Joe McManus, our district leader. Um, we have Damon Kelly from Lutheran Social Services, Bernard Arthur Richardson from Bulb, Cynthia Cox, our district leader. Thank you all for being with us. And as uh, additional folks come in, I will acknowledge them. But I would like to take a moment now to introduce uh, someone who I've known for many years and a 
tremendous hard worker in our community, uh, and that is our Deputy Borough President, Marika Scott McFadden. You can keep clapping, it takes a long time in heels. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and happy Black History Month. And before I begin my remarks, um, those of you who were here at this um, event last year may remember that I was an honoree and I couldn't make it. So I'm going to take this opportunity, I'm going to take a point of personal privilege and to say thank you to the congressman and also the senator for last year's award. It's never too late to say thank you. And so, um, you know, celebrating Black History Month is, is about celebrating where we've come from and acknowledging our struggles and strengths. It's about rising together to keep on pushing towards a better future for all of our people. Remembering the past gives us the inner strength to continue making history. Black History Month gives us an opportunity to say thank you to those who came before us. Thank you to Saint Latour for his, well, my Creole isn't that great, so please forgive them, <laughs> for his noble act of leading the Haitian slave revolt in 1804 that led to an independent Haiti. Thank you to Charles Drew for developing a method of blood transfusion that saved many allied lives during the World War II. Thank you to Shirley Chisholm, the first African-American woman in Congress in 1968, and the first woman and African-American to seek the nomination for president of the United States from one of the two major political parties in 1972. Her model was unbossed and unbought. We want to thank Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. for having a dream. And thank you, President Barack Obama, for answering the call. Here in the Bronx, we continue to make contributions to Black History Month. We have Assemblyman Carl Hasty, the first African-American New York State Assembly Speaker in over 200 years of legislative history. We have our own district attorney, Darcel Clark, the first and only African-American woman to be district attorney in New York State. And of course, we must give a round of applause today for our honorees, Mr. Danny Barber, Judge Elizabeth Taylor, my personal favorite, Monica Major, <laughs> and Benjamin Tucker who are all here continuing to make black history. We stand on the shoulders of giants, the shoulders of individuals who have come before us. I wish you all a happy Black History Month. And remember that we make black history every day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Deputy, uh, and my best to the borough president and everyone in your office. Um, so now we get to the really fun part of today's program where we start, uh, where we can listen to our honorees. And we really have such a great group of honorees this year, and I would like to thank all of them for being with us. The first honoree today is NYPD First Deputy Commissioner Benjamin B. Tucker. In his role, he directs, designs, and implements a broad range of policy programs and training to strengthen community relations and improve the performance of the, the department. Beginning in 1972, Mr. Tucker served as an NYPD officer for 22 years. Uh, this was followed by a time in public service as 
executive and several local and federal government agencies, including the Mayor's Office of Operations, the Commission on Human Rights, the Manhattan Borough President's Office, and the Department of Education. In 1995, President Bill Clinton appointed Mr. Tucker as the Deputy Director for Operations in the Office of Community-Oriented Policing Services at the United States Department of Justice. In 2009, President Barack Obama nominated him as a, director, direct, as a Deputy Director of State, Local, and Tribal Affairs within the House, White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. Benjamin Tucker is a tenured president at Pace University. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree from John Jay College of Criminal Justice and a JD from Fordham University School of Law. In 2014, Benjamin Tucker was appointed to his, first current, to his current role as first Deputy Commissioner of the NYPD, where he continues to work for the benefit of our communities. With, uh, I will now turn it over to Congressman Serrano uh, to help me introduce uh, our honoree. The reason he did that is because we, I forgot to tell you that every uh, honoree will receive a proclamation from the New York State Senate <clears throat> and a write-up in the congressional record. And I want to, I'm going to join the senator in paying tribute to such a fine honoree and a person who is so respected in our community and throughout the city and throughout the nation, because it's not every day that a president appoints you to something. And he was appointed quite a few times by President Obama throughout the years. So congratulations. Thank you. Please join us. Take a photo, please. Traditional photo op, yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, so, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's a uh, it's a real honor. Uh, to, to be with you this morning, and I was quite surprised, frankly, when, when I received notice that, uh, that I was uh, going to be honored uh, along with uh, Elizabeth and, and Monica and Daniel uh, this morning. And so I thank uh, uh, the senator over here, the son and the senator, and, uh, and the dad and the uh, congressman uh, on, my, on my left. Um, let me just say, you know, you have already, and thank you for acknowledging the, the police presence here today. Um, I, I, you know, I came back to the department actually in 2014 as the deputy commissioner for training, and after I got a call from uh, from Bill Bratton asking if I had an interest in returning, and I and I had planned to stay in the Obama administration until the end, uh, but but I love the NYPD, and actually I started in the NYPD in 1969. Uh, so this year, on November 21st, will be my 50th year since I was sworn in. And, and so I, I, I'm one of the few people probably, certainly in the department, who has the privilege and the honor and the ability to look back 50 years on and, and know what the department was like then and what it is now. And I have to tell you that, that the difference is night and day, 180 degree diametrically opposed from, from you know, when you look at the, the complement of the department, at, at, back then the department was 98% male white. Um, women had to sue to take the promotional exam. Uh, and on and on, I could, I could tell you, I could speak to you for, all, for hours about, about those things. Uh, we were in a very different place. Corruption was rampant and crime was on the rise. Uh, today, we are at a point where uh, the department is minority, uh, majority minority. Uh, the, our members of the department speak over 100 different languages from, from you know, probably 150 different countries, and, and it keeps getting better and better and better. And so that the department looks exactly like, in many ways, the city, the, uh, the people who live in New York City. And that makes a huge, makes a huge difference. So, so I just, you know, in the presence of all of you here who already know how great uh, the contingent of uh, our, bor our borough commander, Larry, and the rest of the team, uh, executive staff here, 
how well they do and what they do well so well uh, to keep the city safe. They are the reason that the department looks different. They are the, the reason that the department is making the strides that it's made in both in, in especially not only in keeping crime down, it's the lowest, we have the lowest numbers that, have, have, that we've had in years, but, but more importantly, I think, is the value of, of bringing community and police together, closer together, to work together with the shared responsibility of doing uh, what we should do best, and that is keeping the city safe. So I just had to say that because I think it's, it's really important. Uh, and just one more minute on, on me. Um, you know, uh, we've heard the comment, we stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before us. Um, we've heard that a number of times this morning. It's absolutely true, and uh, certainly true in my case. Uh, it's hard for me to believe that I get to stand before you this morning as the first deputy of the NYPD, the greatest police department in the world. It really is. Uh, um, and, I, and, I, and frankly, I used to hesitate to say that, um, but I don't hesitate anymore because I know it's not just what we believe, but it, it is what colleagues think of us around the nation, our law enforcement colleagues and others, but also our colleagues around the world. Um, our colleagues in law enforcement around the world feel the same way. And so um, I'm privileged to be, to be back in the department now five years uh, since returning and, and had the honor of being appointed first deputy commissioner at the end of 2014 by Commissioner Bratton. Um, I grew up in Brooklyn, so I'm here in the Bronx, and, uh, uh, but I grew up on, in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, and, um, and so I, I, I have lots of people that I can point to that were people who spoke to me, who I watched from afar, who I admired, and who, who inspired me to do what I've done in my life. And so that's really what it's all about, and I try to pay back you know, uh, pay that forward with, with respect to how, particularly around our young people who I care mostly about, and, and you all know why that's so important in, in this city at this time. And uh, so anything that, that we can do, and, and the department has, has reached out uh, to, the, to the youth community uh, across the, the city, and, and I have to say that the connections that are being made to really give youngsters uh, an opportunity to see what's possible in their lives, which is really what we want to do, uh, if they don't have that ability to see it, have a vision and to, and to, and to follow uh, examples of the values of the people that they see around them that are doing positive things, then they lose. And so, so that's the goal, I think. Uh, no matter what else, ever else we do in the department, we, we strive to really encourage our young people, keep them close, our explorers, our cadets, our, you know, our youth council uh, young people. All of that makes a huge difference because um, I came into this, part, this department as a kid, as a baby, at 18 years old, and um, and I've been able to you know to rise to the highest levels um, because of so many other people as well. So I want to again thank thank uh, the senator and the congressman uh, for their support and also for the for the awards. And let me also uh, say to Alfonso, uh, who is he, we've known each other for for years. Uh, probably 35 years at least. Uh, he is an amazing individual and someone I've always looked up to uh, because he tells it like it is. And, and, and good things happen when you do that. So thanks very much. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another round of applause for First Commissioner. Ben Tucker. Now I have the distinct honor of calling up our next honoree, someone who I've known and admired for, for many years, and that's Judge Elizabeth Taylor. Um, born and raised in the High Bridge section of the Bronx, which is my Senate district, uh, Elizabeth Taylor is a judge for the New York Supreme Court's 12th Judicial District. Ms. Taylor began her career as a legislative aide in the New York City Council, and she went on to private practice, where she focused on landlord-tenant issues. She returned to the public sector as a senior court attorney for Judge Justice Edgar Walker. Uh, from February 1999 through December of 2008, she served as principal law clerk for New York uh, Supreme Court Justice Ken Thompson. In 1997, she founded the Thurgood Marshall Junior Mark Trial Program to positively introduce students to the judicial system while exposing them to role models and careers in the legal field. Uh, in 2018, the residents of Bronx County elected Judge Taylor 
to the position of Justice of the Supreme Court in the state of New York after decades of committed work as a lawyer and judge in service to her community. Uh, I will ask the congressman to come up and uh, join me here as we present uh, this award, these awards, to Judge Elizabeth Taylor. And to think that before that she had a great Hollywood career, you know what I mean? Thank you, Congressman and Senator, for this prestigious award. Our youth, we either have positive or negative influences that shape us. In my life, I would start off, I would go with my judicial career. I had a mentor. My mentor, the late Justice Janice Bowman, for those who knew, she had a vision for me that I didn't see for myself. And that was to become a judge, actually to start off as a court attorney and then become a judge. In 1997, I started the Thurgood Marshall Junior Mock Trial Program because when I was in seventh grade, over here by Roberto Clemente 166, I wanted to be an attorney. And at that time, there were no role models that I knew of that were attorneys. And I just knew I wanted to be an attorney. Um, fortunately, I was blessed to become an attorney and I decided to come back to my community to start this program for seventh and eighth graders so that they can see a positive introduction to our judicial system. And the program is in its 22nd year. And what we do is we recruit attorneys from the area and they go out to these middle schools and they prepare the students to become prosecutors, defense attorneys, and witnesses. And every year throughout the month of May, we have elimination rounds at the courthouse. So I would invite you to come out there. But I would like to acknowledge two of my colleagues who are here today, and that's Justice Laura Douglas, the supervising judge of civil court. And newly elected Justice Naida Samaj James, <laughs> civil court. And I would like to tell you the reason that I'm here is because of all of the people that support me throughout the program. And these two here, along with others, it's because of them. They step in, they do the groundwork. Sometimes during the competition, they don't like to speak to me because they say that they say things about me, but the, on the serious point, on the serious point, we work together and we don't do it ourselves. So I have them to thank and all of the attorneys and other judges that um, participate to make the program a success. Thank you. And, and I would like to congratulate my co-honorees. Thank you. Our next honoree is Ms. Monica Major. She's a native Bronxite. Monica Major serves as the direct Director of Education and Youth Services for Bronx Borough President Ruben Diaz, Jr. In this capacity, she engages with issues concerning access to quality education and is the voice for over 239,955 children, young people, in our borough. Prior to taking on this role, she served as the Bronx representative on the panel of education policy. Ms. Major served as a volunteer for Community School District 11 for several years and served the president 
for District 11 Community Education Council. As parent advocate, she served on the Citywide Parent Commission on School Governance to ensure that the Bronx parents' voices were heard loud and clear on school governance issues. She is a member of the National Council of the Negro Women North Bronx Section. She's a proud mother of two children and is certified mediator and remains active in our community, in her community too. It is really something special whenever you honor someone who's in the education field, who's advocating for education, because nothing has been said to be truer that what we give our children at home and in school is what they grow up with and what they become. And it never changes. That's something that every community knows, every uh, generation knows, but we continue to struggle to make it so and to make it better every day. And when we have someone like Ms. Major, we have someone who really is committed to this. So please, if you would come up to receive your uh, recognition, which is so well deserved. So good morning. Good morning. So, and to the sirs, <laughs> um, the Honorable uh, Congressman uh, Serrano and the Honorable New York State Senator Serrano, uh, thank you for your service and your support of our community. I'm grateful to be here today uh, for this acknowledgement of my contribution um, to the community of the work that we do here. I'm blessed to be in the company of my fellow honorees. Um, I've worked with and called on Danny on many times and he takes my phone calls. Um, his passion for the community is unmatched, so thank you, Danny. Um, the success of Judge Taylor's mock trial program uh, has benefited many students in our borough and we're always grateful for the service and the uh, commitment of the NYPD. So congratulations to you all, thank you. I always get asked the question, what does a director of education and youth services do because it's a mouthful? Um, so, my job description, my mission statement, and my goals are all the same. And um, besides being a, a parent advocate, it was where I started. Um, when my daughter entered uh, first grade, uh, well, we did kindergarten in a private school, and I remember walking into the school, and I said, um, we're partners for the next few years, so we need to get to know each other. And I want every parent to always walk into a school and say that to the principal, yeah. to the teachers, that we are partners and we're going to do this together. Okay. Um, so one of the things I do as, as an advocate is I advocate for educational quality for every parent and for all students in the Bronx. So the word is every parent and all students. So I don't get to take a break and choose who I'm going to advocate for. Um, because everybody matters. So thank you for that numbers count. I didn't know it was 200,000 I'm advocating for. That's a lot. Um, because it, 239. <laughs> and, 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 and sometimes one family, one student, <laughs> seems like it's all of that. Um, but I would, I would never change that. Um, I could not possibly do the work that I do without the help of my colleagues and my team, the phenomenal at the Borough President's Office, Tracy and Deputy Borough President, um, and with our partners such as Hostos, who is always uh, supporting us, and with many of you that I've worked with in, in this room um, several and for, for many years. Um, I admit I love the work, and I love being in service to my community. And every day I pray that I'm doing the best that I can, and I'm doing it to the glory of God. So once again, thank you for this honor. You know, besides bragging about my son, in Congress I brag about two things a lot. 
Well, I also brag about that I represent Yankee Stadium. And, uh, <laughs> I was tested this year, my God, in that World Series. There was Boston, the hated team, with a Puerto Rican manager. Oh, I don't, I don't want to tell you what conflicting thoughts that was, you know. But it worked out to his benefit. So, uh, And the other thing I brag about uh, is that I was a paraprofessional in the school system in District 7, and that I spent some very good years of my life in the Millbrook Houses, and Millbrook Projects, as we used to now call housing developments. But to me, they're still the projects, because yeah. that's, that's who they are. Which brings us to our next honoree. Daniel Barber, known to many as simply Danny, was born and raised in the Bronx and still calls the borough home. As a young a at a young age, Danny understood the treasured value of service, often attending Salvation Army services and lending a hand where needed. Upon graduating with honors at DeWitt Clinton High School, Danny continued his work at the Salvation Army, becoming director and assistant to the commanding officer. Several years later, he successfully ran for president of Andrew Jackson House's Resident Association. In his role as president, Danny assists not just residents of his development, but public housing as a whole. He has shown a great deal of love and care for NYCHA and for NYCHA's youth and senior population. Danny holds the title as chair of Citywide Council of Presidents and is responsible for all of 320 plus NYCHA developments in his role as chair, 320 plus NYCHA developments. He has and continues to champion rights of residents who have been disenfranchised. In addition to his work with NYCHA, Danny serves as founder of Save Our Youth, Inc., Citywide Council of Presidents, Youth Chairman, Community Board One Member, Youth Mentor at PS29, and Brox Works Classic Center Advisory Council, among several other organizations. Reminds me of what I did before I got elected, so don't please, don't decide to run against me any <laughs> time. <laughs> this, this scares me a lot. <laughs> As a lifelong Bronxite, Danny is always eager to tackle issues in any way that he can while maintaining the same dedication, love, and commitment he has put into his decades-long work. Danny is the son of the late Dan Walker and Janie Barber Walker. After the passing of his mother in 2013, Danny became the primary guardian of his little brother, Kenneth, who is living with a disability. Danny, we know that NYCHA is on the forefront of the issues on a daily basis because it has been not taken care of for so many years and it started a long time ago. And I think what happened with NYCHA is something that happened also with our subway system. And it's something that can be debated and people will disagree with me. But I think we New Yorkers in government have a problem and that is that whenever things are going well, we kind of leave it alone. Government in general does that. So the subway system was a, a jewel in the nation and we left it alone instead of maintaining it. And NYCHA housing, was the best in the nation. I mean, I remember when my mom uh, had the inspector come in from the local NYCHA office in Millbrook, the local manager's office, to inspect every couple of months the apartment to see how we kept it. And if they didn't like what was happening to the walls or whatever, you would have to deal with them on that, you see? And then it became one where we don't care what you do to the apartment because we don't care what happens to the apartment, you know? And so you then have people who are trying to struggle to get a better way of life. And NYCHA was never supposed to be the lesser of the two available housings. It was supposed to be the better of the two available housings in the community. And those years that I spent in Millbrook, you know, they weren't 20 years, but they formed me. They, they taught me a lot. And at that time, it was, you know, there were still Irish kids uh, living in NYCHA. That's how long ago it is. You know, and Italian kids, and then the African Americans, and the Puerto Ricans. And I learned so much there that I didn't learn anywhere else. So Danny, we want to congratulate you. We want to honor you. And please come up and get your award so that
nice to Danny. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I was asking a question to everyone on this side. Did you write a speech? Uh, Anthony Jordan didn't say write a speech, so I didn't write a speech. But um, I want to say to the fellow honorees, Deputy Commissioner, great things happened in 69. You entered the department and I was born. Um, um, to Madam Your Honor, keep doing the great work with the young people. I know that they appreciate you and your colleagues, so I say thank you very much on behalf of the youth of the South Bronx and the Bronx and all. Thank you, ma'am, for all that you do. And to my sister, my buddy, we don't always agree. Um, she calls me. I do answer the phone. I cry like a little baby to get my point across. She hears me. Then sometimes I say she's not listening. Then she tells me she hears me, and I know she's listening. Monica May, just thank you for all that you do. Um, I thank you all for coming out, and I see a lot of colleagues and beautiful people that I work with, um, from VIP services to Ms. Helen Hines in the back, to Noskadamos, to my fellow resident association presidents and residents that came out to show support, and this to the communities of NYPD, thank you. Because there was a time when I was one of those knuckleheads where I wouldn't work with NYPD, and um, I thank you guys. Um, I'm a little upset with the department because we just got a relationship with Captain Galatari, and then you took him away from us. But we still have him in the 40th precinct, but we say thank you for him. He is a godsend to our community, and we really hated to lose him at PSA 7, but glad we still have him at the 40th. Um, I thank you all for, I thank the congressman and the senator for choosing me today to give me an honor. So I say thank you. And um, like my parents before me, I stay humble and modest, and I'll continue to fight for God's people and to do the best that I can do. Thank you. Yeah. Danny. Uh, you said about 69, 1969. It's, it's also a trivial question. You know, I'm the king of worthless information. <laughs> but here it is. 1969 and this year, 50 years, 69 was the last time that the same two cities in the World Series were the same two cities in the Super Bowl. That's right. That's right. Uh -huh. <laughs> then it was the Mets. And the Baltimore Colts, right? The amazing Mets. And this time it was New England, Boston, Patriots in the Los Angeles uh, Rams. There you go. Danny, congratulations. And by the way, uh, it's not true that I'm asking Millbrook's name to be changed to Serrano Houses. Not yet. Anyway. You're done? Yeah. Uh, so. Right. So just uh, some closing remarks, but before I do, uh, we've been joined by a good friend um, who really needs no introduction, but someone uh, who I'm very blessed and grateful to have as a colleague in government locally, and that is, and I'm going to put her on the spot, that is our councilwoman, Vanessa Gibson. Please come up here and give us remarks, and our former, former honoree. What year was that? 2009? Throwback? Yeah. <laughs> Let me just say, Vanessa, that uh, 
You know, I always kid around a lot, and I'm always talking about the fact that she texts at 3 o'clock in the morning and the whole thing. But I've never seen an elected official, or I've seen very few, who devote so much time to their work. And you're there. Please, I'm glad you're not texting at 3 o'clock any longer <laughs> in, the, in the morning. I, I slowed down a little. Right. But she is totally, totally committed, and she's a great representative. But more important, she kind of grew up politically at the same time that my son did. So I see her not only as a colleague, but as a daughter also. Thank oh, thank you. Oh, wow. We didn't even practice that. Hi, everyone. Good morning, thank you so much. I am so honored to always be here and I do apologize. My city hall duties, I had to go downtown this morning for a public safety hearing, but I also wanna send greetings on behalf of our Deputy Chief, Faust, Assistant Chief, Fausto Pichardo, who used to serve as the commanding officer of the 4-3 precinct. So he's testifying this morning at City Hall and I said, let me go and make sure I'm there. And then I got here as soon as I could. But thank you all, welcome to Hostos Community College. Thank you, Dr. Gomez, for always welcoming us here at your home. Happy Black History Month. We are excited. And while we are given the shortest month of the year, it's OK. Because how many of you recognize we celebrate black history every single day? Every single day in our community, we come together and celebrate black excellence, our African heritage, the incredible culture, diversity that we bring to the table, our talents, our skills, all of the great things that have been happening within our community. And so while February is the designated month, we are always honored to come together to recognize our trailblazers, our pioneers, those who have truly paved the way, who have made a difference, who have stood through the test of time, who have defied the odds, who do the work every day despite the challenges, despite all of the hurdles that we know we have faced throughout our journey. And yet here we are. Yet here we are recognizing our incredible community leaders. And of course, I'm honored because I know every single honoree. And I want to join with Congressman Jose Serrano and Senator Jose Serrano, who have been my friends for years, uh, my partners in government. I'm so honored to work with them and all of my colleagues in government because we do this every year. And it's not easy out of the large constituency that we represent, but somehow we managed to pick the best of the best of the best. And so I want to join with all of you in recognizing our first deputy commissioner of the NYPD, Benjamin Tucker. Congratulations and God bless you, my friends. Our education champion for the Bronx Borough President, Monica Major. God bless you, my sister. Always making sure we fund projects together in the district. And who could ever, ever forget our champion for residents who live in public housing? He serves in many capacities, not just as CCOP president, as president of Andrew Jackson Houses, but truly a voice that represents all of us, and that is our CCOP president, Danny Barber. God bless you. And I see her in the back. I am so proud of her because I've watched her journey as she was first elected to civil court judge. And just last November, we elected her to be our Supreme Court Justice, the Honorable, the real Elizabeth Taylor. So congratulations to each and every one of you. And as this month comes to a close, let us be reminded of the work that remains to be done. Let us be reminded of all the little girls and little boys that desire, that dare to dream, that dare to hope, that dare to recognize that beyond their circumstances, they can be success stories and not statistics. Let us be reminded of the fact that it's important to invest in their education, in their future, to give them opportunities opportunities to make sure that we make their future as bright as possible. We may celebrate, but we also have to remember our history, remember where we have come from, our ancestors that fought the good fight, that were denied the access to, to fundamentally vote, to be literate, the poll taxes, the literacy taxes, and all of the exams that many of our ancestors had to endure. And here we are, 
saying to God be the glory. We have a lot of work to do. Although things are not perfect, look at how far God has brought us, and we are a grateful people. And even just last night, I can't tell you I'm so happy about our black folks. I am just so happy. Black excellence at the Oscars. Amazing. Seven African-American men and women received Oscars, and many the first, the first. That's what black history is all about. And so let us be reminded as we leave this space of our defined work, of our plan, of our passion, and of our purpose. You do not need a title in front of your name to care about the future of your community. But we need each and every one of you people, whether you are African American or not, we need each and every one of you. And so I end with just saying, simply put this, African American History Month is American history. It's about our fundamental principles, our foundation, the journey that our people have been on. But you know what, family? It's up to us to keep on that journey, to set our own footprints in history, to make a difference, to be the difference, to go out and be the change agents that are needed in our society to show our young people something different than what they have been shown. So happy Black History Month to my brothers and sisters. May God bless you and keep you, and congratulations to all of our honorees. God bless you all. Let me just say, uh, in closing, well, you'll close, but uh, in, in preliminary closing, that uh, most of you in this room are people who, on a daily basis, encourage other people to succeed, encourage other people to keep on a straight path. At times, lately, and this is not a political statement, just a statement of fact, our country looks like it's wavering. And so people keep questioning the ability of this country to continue on its great path. I can tell you from the inside, we're still the greatest country on earth, you know? And although, although there's some red hats that say make, make America great again, I say America has always been great. It's still great. It just needs more people to share in its greatness. That's, the, that's what we're committed to. So don't give up. And one last point, and here's, I'm going back years ago. The flag, this flag, belongs to all of us. There are people who serve us in the military. There are people who serve us in law enforcement. That's our flag. Don't let anybody from another side of the political spectrum say, that flag belongs to certain people. It's my flag as much as it's your flag. It's his flag. I was born in Puerto Rico. He was born in New York of Puerto Rican parents. It's our flag. Amen. Thank you so much. And, and I just want to say thank you to all of the honorees and everyone who helped make this possible. We have food. Uh, I don't want it to get cold, so I want everyone to avail themselves of some of the yummy food. And I also ask that all of the honorees, if we can get together in the back for a group photo before you all leave. But thank you all so much for coming, and have a wonderful, blessed day. Thank you.